against it. And we were really surprised when we went to training a couple of weeks ago how few jurisdictions had, had jumped on that bandwagon to utilize that. Some benefits of optical scan, if you really haven't seen it, it uh, you have a piece of paper that's a permanent record. So if there's ever a recount, there's no question that you can go back and look at a piece of paper and see what's been done. And the other is, and I think we had at the last presidential election, we had some complaints about uh, lines. It only takes seven seconds to scan a ballot. And the nice thing about this is, once you check people in, you can have 20 places for them to sit down, and if we have a bunch of constitutional amendments like we did that year, um, they can sit down and read and take their time, and they're not holding anybody else up. Whereas, whereas when we use the wind vote machines, if they stand there and they didn't pre-read their constitutional amendments, which we know everybody usually does, um, then they're holding that machine up. In this case, they wouldn't. So we, we expect uh, no more lines, or, or very minimal, even, even in that situation. If we go through with this, obviously the advantage is if we make the switch all at one time, we're, we're not having to pay service contracts on two different machines. Um, we are able to train all of our uh, poll officials uh, on the same type of equipment. So if we need to, at last minute, move people from one polling area to another, that, that training issue wouldn't be a problem. And then we would, um, part of this, and we've already put into the planning stages, that we would start, uh, we have a presentation that we would start hitting the civic groups and churches and educate people on what they're going to see when they vote and how these optical scans work. Questions? All right. Your proposal that we have in front of us, just to make sure I understand, um, it has, we have the Dominion voting budgetary quote. Yes, sir. Um, it says $50,000 for the outright purchase one year. Yes, sir. 50763 um, and then you have ongoing annual fees, like firmware, extended warranty, database coding, those kind of things. Yes, sir. They add up to another $8,000. Yes, sir. Then you have outright purchase, oh, total cost of ownership over six years. We had asked them if they had any type of lease purchase plan. Mm -hmm. We were just looking at all different options. Okay. Um, but obviously, when you, when you add that up, you're paying quite a bit more. They, they took the 10000 off of the $50,000 one, one shot. Okay. Right. All right. I'm not sure I, I'm, I understand the, the 95, but we'll, we'll ask some other questions. There is one problem. You have 11 machines. Yes. There are six of us. <laughs> six doesn't go into 11. Well, okay. so somebody's going to have the short one district thing. No, 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 no. Let me, let me explain again, because we, have, we actually have three polling locations where two pre precincts vote. Right. Um, help me out. I know it's county it's, line. It's Madison, mm -hmm. Mattapanai. And the high school. And Western Carolina. Right. Okay. So those are the three that are all on the same place. So they get to share a machine. One machine. Yes, one sir. Machine. So one, two, three. He has three polling places. So that's six. You have two. Everybody oh, it's just, it's just, it's just Woodford and, and, okay, so two, then you got two, then you got two. So that's nine. One then for the cap, and one do the for, voting, and one spare in case something were to break. Okay. How many machines broke at Mattapanai last, last year? Was it one or two? I know we had one out of service for the longest time. But I think we're dealing, that's a little apples and oranges between a wind vote machine and an optical scan. But it's electronics and I electronics. I understand. Right. And there, there's a I could run a magnet over any no, computer no, you got and break it. No, sir. So. And, but there is, um, again, one of the, the benefits of a paper ballot that we hope we never have to use. But within the ballot box, now when you feed it into the scanner, it will automatically put it into the ballot box that's sealed. Mm -hmm. But there's an option if, if 
even for that temporary time that it breaks down before we get another machine there. Um, there's a place to put that ballot that's secure. It's, it's not counted at that time, but it meets all the legal requirements of the state. You can just hold it until the machine is back up and running yes, and then run them through the scanner again. And then even in a word, the, for instance, the, the optical scan machine that would be at the cap is actually programmed to do all the precincts. They can be programmed to do up to 99 mm -hmm. precincts if you all want to expand some more. But that one... <laughs> I was a little slow on that joke. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> but that one, you could actually, in a worst case scenario, if you did have more than one break, you could actually run them through that machine. Okay. My question is, do at 11, is that enough? Yeah. I think at least 12, but well, you're you know, saying is, I'm asking you again, is that enough? That's my only question. We feel secure in this 11. Obviously, if, if, if you don't, then I'm sure they would love to sell you another one. If we're, we're not planning to split up any of our polling, our precincts that have three, or have two and one, but if we were to ever split one of those up, move it, then we would have to have another machine. But as long as there's two and one, the machine recognizes which precinct it is when mm -hmm. it runs through, and then at the end of the day, it gives them a take that has precinct A and precinct B separated. But if we were to separate one of those three locations that has two, we would need another machine. But um, Which you probably won't get the same price for because this is their once-in-a-lifetime buy-now price. Let me mention, I, I, because while I was at training, um, I did speak with the state, um, and they're in the process of putting out to bid because they, they have seen that different jurisdictions are getting different prices, but part of that contract they put out, if it comes back cheaper than what we've gotten, then we're going to get the discount. Okay. They're writing that into their proposal. You said the last question for me is you said you saved $15,000 in this year's budget or last year's budget? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Two so reimbursements. I only got to give you $35,000? <laughs> I'm not looking at her okay. yet. You said you saved $15,000 that, in this year's way budget. That's the way it was. So we put about $6,000 from the reimbursement from the um, uh, electric poll books and about another, what? Almost ten for the. Yeah. It was nine. It was nine something for the uh, DS two hundred, and then forty nine something for the electronic poll book. Okay. Oh, and the DS two hundred, we can since we want to try and switch over to this one machine, we can go out and sell that one. In which case, then the money that we get from that will come back to the county. Okay, so that's a good idea. That. That's a good idea. That, that's a current machine, so that right. there is a market for that. You know, and All we right. could keep it, you know, to use okay. it to back up, but, but we wouldn't. All right, Mrs. Hatcher is saying you didn't save $15,000, so okay. give us the bad news, Mrs. Hatcher. That's all right. to bubble, but when we had already budgeted for the revenue to offset what you got for the grant, so that's already been taken in account. Not, it's not just, it, we already, it's an offset. And at the time you'd ask for the things before we had to post the July payroll, so your numbers came down. Right. And, and plus we're still doing payables now going back to June, uh -huh. so it's all going down. Okay. So I, I don't, won't have a, a final number until we finish with Jim. Okay. So based no, on the trying. accounting, we don't think it's fifteen or she doesn't think it's fifteen thousand. Nice try though. But we really, tried. really appreciate that. Nice try. All but right. we did get reimbursed on everything we bought. We only got it because it was um, we could get half paid. Okay. And then you do have the AS two hundred that you can conceivably sell and then use that, you're going to give that money back to the county and then yeah, we'll try to, we'll use it for you to buy more machines if we have. Okay. And there may be an overseas market for the win votes also. But we, that we, we haven't explored that yet, we don't know about that. was a joke, right? No, sir. <laughs> okay. You, we, can't, we can't sell the You can't sell them in Virginia. Virginia's they vote with their thumbs, so, <laughs> all right. Okay, um, 
We don't have any, we don't have any money budgeted for this, of course. No, sir. So it would have to come out of the unencumbered balance. Um, questions from the board? Mr. Black. Yeah, I just got a quick question for you. I see on here that you've got the $50,000 outright purchase one year. And then you've got the $8,000 or $9,000 extended warranty, database coverage, fire, uh, you know, licenses and so forth. My next question is when it says uh, right here, manage uh, services program for six years, 88, is that just like a warranty or for the, where you get the, uh, down at the bottom, the 88,544? Yes. 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 Okay. And which is comparable to what we're paying now on the windows. I mean, that's. Okay. Because we're, we're having to pay oh, for a, a service contract, plus each time we program is um, fifteen to $2,000 per election. Computer. So you're paying that now, right now, in the machines we've got now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so technically that should not be a budgetary increase. Then. Not, it, it shouldn't change any. And that's one of the reasons, that's one of the advantages. If, if we yeah, have to do this in piecemeal, that's where it really hurts us, because if... Um, if we have multiple types of machines, we'll still, it, it doesn't matter how many machines, it's still that programming fee for each election. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Silly. So the total cost of the 11 machines with the six years maintenance is 88,544? Mm-mm. Yeah. My understanding is it, it was... No. No. Isn't that the 95 number? Yeah. The 88 number is basically services. For six years. That's programming for services. Not programming. Not programming the service contracts. Okay, maintenance contracts. Yes, sir. Okay. So it's... Am I right, though, that's what... For the 11 machines and the service contract, 88,544? For six years. For six years. Yes. I mean, no, we don't pay that no, every year. No. That's a one-time cost for right. six years. No, it's 14, 14, 14 per year. 14, 14 per year. a year. But, but you said and. And is not correct because the 88 only covers that maintenance contract. Correct. So we have to pay 88 for maintenance and the 50,000 for the machines. Yes. Okay. So it's not 88 for the and. It's 138 for the and. Over six years. Right. Over six years. And we're paying about the 14 a year now for... for so what, do we, on what do we have to appropriate right. if we, if we 50, were to do this? 000. Just the 50000 now and then every year the, for the next six years we're locked in it, whatever the 14 is. Yeah, and it's, it's, again, essentially I think well, it's, eight, it's nine is not in there. close to what we're paying now for the, okay. machines for the service contract. I was just trying to figure out what the, what what the total cost was if we were to... The other additional forward. expense we're going to have is, is the <coughs> printing of ballots, which is not something that we've had to... To do in the to past. Do, and they're about, what, 24 cents a piece. Okay, thank you. Questions, Mr. Underwood? No, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Akers, questions? No. Mr. Taylor? No. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Culley, just to make sure we all understand, we, we believe uh, that, that we need to appropriate an additional $50,000, 50763 to be exact, because something similar to the $14,000 annual maintenance contract is already in your budget. Yes. And it's in, in your budget for the wind vote machines. If you're not using that money for them, you can use that money for this. Yeah. So we need 50763 and that money would have to come out of the unencumbered balance. Um, since it is for all citizens, we're trying to do something better. You promised me no lines? I think they're going to be much better. And people who use the machine this time loved it. I mean, okay. we asked for feedback from everybody who used the machine, and they all loved it. They, they liked having that piece of paper in their hand. Yes. I will tell you, what, when we were at training, one of the topics that came up, and statistically, no county in Virginia that were using optical scans reported problems with lines. Mr. Chairman? Okay. Yes, sir. One of the last things you just said just kind of caught my attention. Mm -hmm. The additional cost we will have is printing the ballots. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. How many ballots, like in a presidential election, I guess maximum, how many ballots are we going to, have we, have we factored that in? We just, 
We have just shy of 19,000 registered voters. And they, they recommend, and, and obviously we'll get a feel for it, but uh, they recommend for a presidential that you have enough for every registered voter. But we normally in November have about a 74 to 76 turnout in November. Primaries at 5 percent. So have you factored in a budget for that at all, what you estimate you would spend on ballots? Well, obviously it would depend on how many elections you had that year, if you had a special election, um, all those factor into it. But Roughly saying, for a presidential, we're, we're right about uh, $5,000. That's just for ballot. That does, ballot. That's just for the, the general election. That doesn't include the primary, though, right? Correct. And obviously, it would be a lot less for the, I mean, you know, we, not a lot of people turned out for the primary. Well, this primary, right. this, this past primary. But if you have right. a presidential primary where you've got, you know, in the next election, there won't be an incumbent, right. you'll have a lot more. Yeah, that's that's a that's a factor that we have to add into your it budget. Is, yes, it's yes, not in your budget this year. We've so not had to deal with that. No, but November you're going to use these machines. Yes, sir. So that that cost will be in this year's budget as a cost overrun. Yes, sir. Well, so just like the health department, unless we can save, unless no, unless we can save somewhere else. <laughs> just like the health department, don't come back to us and ask for that money <laughs> after you overran it. It's not going to happen. Just like it didn't happen for them. It's not going to happen. But all right, we understand that case, and we will have to make that money up. So um, we would need a motion to appropriate $50,763 from the unencumbered balance for the purchase of, um, of um, no, we're getting rid of win votes. Dominion voting? Dominion voting. Dominion voting machine. That's, that's it. You want to make that motion? So moved. Mr. Akers made the motion. Mr. Taylor makes a second. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much for Thank your you. presentation. Thank you. And, and now since the um, Supreme Court made one of the biggest mistakes in the world, we don't have to go through preclearance. So you can take those machines anywhere and train people. Yes, yes right. We could do that before. We just, okay. um, um, and we got Department of Justice approval for using optical scans. Right. So we did get that approval. But we could take them to do training, like we could take our win vote, we could, but we couldn't give out voter applications, right. couldn't give out um, uh, absentee applications. Even when it was in the middle of absentee, I would have to tell them, even though I'm standing in come front of my building, you'll have to come back Monday. Right. I couldn't give it. But I could tell them to, you know, uh, I just, I couldn't do voter registration or absentee take any paperwork without right. Department of Justice approval. Okay. Well, we're, we're good for right now. Yes. And if we're relying on Congress to come to an agreement, we'll probably be in the same way for years. So <laughs> thank you, folks. Have a great day. Thank, thank, thank you. you. See you again. Thank you. Appointments. The Building Code of Appeals. I don't think that was me. Who was that? Mr. Chairman, I don't uh, I uh, had not have a chance to talk to the uh, at least one of the people that Mr. Benjamin sent me that would be eligible for appointment to this okay. uh, board. Uh, so I'd like to postpone mine until the next meeting. It doesn't expire until November. So. You have yours, Mr. Taylor? Yeah, I'll, I'll All right. We will carry that over. Um, they didn't expire until, yeah. They actually expire in November. Um, how about we bring that back September? Just send us a reminder. Okay. Consent agenda. Anything uh, anyone would like to have pulled off the consent agenda? Mr. Black. Chairman, I'd like to pull off um, the uh, consent agenda item letter D. Or letter D. D, amendments to solid waste convenience site standards. Anything else? Motion to approve A, B, C, and E would be in order. So moved, Mr. Chairman. There's Second. Motion made by Mr. Seeley, seconded by Mr. Underwood. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. That motion carries unanimously. Mr. Black, agenda item number D. Well, I guess uh, at the last meeting we had a, um, we had a you know, discussion about the um, you know, convenience site standards and so forth, and we had, we had talked about um, you know, the too-good-to-throw-away pile and you know, the, 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 the scrap metal pile. And... Um, 
my concern now is, from what I'm gathering, is not only are we not going to let that happen, which there was not, a, you know, there was not consensus on the board to do that. My concern is now we're taking away the too good to throw away pile from the Lady Smith convenience site, and I don't think that's correct or fair to the people of the western part of the county. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Schiebel, on that. Well, bef bef before you go through that, I, I just wanted to ask him. Um, have we actually spent money in creating two good throwaway sites? We purchased um, shelters for each of the sites right. that we were going yeah. to use. Uh, we've actually used those now. They're going over top of, they've been installed over top of each of our uh, current oil tanks to help protect them from the weather. Uh, and we're trying to get a contractor back to be able to do uh, fats, oils, and grease, cooking oils, uh, okay. recycling, and that would also go underneath of there. But, but, the, but the, the, you had actually spent money for the too good to throw away, thinking we were going to move forward to that. Not that that's wrong. That was a good, smart move. The board approved that right. nine right. months ago to do those things. Okay. We didn't have money in the current last year's budget to move forward with that. Okay. So we okay. put money in this okay. year's budget. But forty eight, forty seven hundred dollars. Okay. 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 Wait. But because you did that, and then we decided to not do all the convenience sites, then we basically have. Your, your option now, which is good, good again, smart move, to say, yes, I'll use this to protect the oil. Now Mr. Black is saying, because our discussion at the last meeting was, maybe the, maybe the Bowling Green site was the only one big enough with enough you know, roadway, real estate, whatever, to have too good to throw away. But if anybody else wants it too good to throw away or, or thinks they need it too good to throw away, that's fine. So we may have to, the whole point was we may have to back out that shelter that's over the oil in Ladysmith or Port Royal, wherever, to go back to the too good to throw away. So I believe that's what Mr. Black's yeah. thought process is. I'll let him finish. No, I mean, that's, I, I just don't think that's fair because as of it stands right now, if it passes through, the only too good to throw away pile would be in Bowling Green, correct? Uh, is from the board discussion in our last meeting, right, correct. Right, yes, that is correct. And I'll be honest with you. No one in Ladysmith, you know, I mean, I don't think anyone from Lake Landor, Childsburg, at least my district is, or very few, are going to travel to Bowling Green to look at a too good to throw away pile. It just, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. And, and, and they, they will not do that. Um, so th that's, that's my first concern. The second concern, like discussed with the board, on the too good to throw away pile, I, I, I just can't wrap myself around the idea of, and, and, Correct me if I'm wrong on this. I'm the one, if I bring that, and Mr. Thomas and I always discuss the bicycle. If I bring the bicycle in and I decide I wanted to go in the scrap metal pile, okay, it's not too good to throw away. If it's a real bicycle and I decide yeah, it's trash, the person who comes into the convenience site can't take it because it's not in the too good to throw away pile, correct? Once it's thrown away, I can't tell you as a citizen where to throw your trash. I mean, we've got to direct you, but to tell you that something it has a value and, and, and you it, want to throw it away and you want to put it in an appropriate recycling container or into an appropriate open top container, as long as it's appropriate, I can't tell you. We try to suggest to people, sir, you can throw those cardboard into our cardboard recycling. If they don't want to do that, I mean, I can't dictate to that citizen you have to do this. Uh, recycling right now is, is an option. We don't okay. mandate that people have to do that. So it's really up to the citizen if they want to recycle those things. Okay, and, and, I, and I understand what you're saying, and I'm not, I'm not trying to waste staff time here, but I guess my concern is this. If, if, if you ha Sometimes it's just common sense. Sometimes it just comes down to common sense. I mean, the reality behind it, if I see a mountain bike in the scrap metal pile, is someone at the convenience site going to say, hey, wait a second here, that's actually, someone could use that. Would they move it to the too good to throw away pile? I mean, I'm if, just looking for If the board instructs us that that's what they want to do, we'll do whatever the board wishes us to do. I mean, it's, it's, again, we presented a, a way to take care of that. The board last meeting asked us to remove it. We'll, we're willing to do whatever the board wants us to do. We just need that direction. Let's do one at a time, Mr. Black. Okay. What do you want to do first? First, do you, would you like to have a too good to throw away on the western side of the county? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Any concerns with that? Yeah, I do. Uh, I have a concern. From a standpoint, at the present time, the Lady Smith site is extremely crowded. And the ones of us that use that site know that on a regular basis, on a regular basis, 
the traffic backs up onto that uh, green road, which is right in a curve, a very dangerous curve. Uh, if we're going to have a too good to throw away, then I think it should be restricted to a particular day. To be honest with you, <laughs> you know, I have not had one phone call. I have not had one email. I have not had one text message. I have not had one person come to me and say, hey, the, the, from the Madison District, to say, this is what I want. I have to have a too good to throw away pile established at the Ladies' Smith Green side. I've not had that. <laughs> and I can tell you, uh, over the years, the people in the Madison District have not been bashful about telling me what they want and what they do not want uh, in the Madison District. So again, I just am concerned about the safety of the people that's using that site because we've had one request. Mr. Sheehan. And, well, and I understand that he's here, and I, and I appreciate what, he's, right. what he wants to do. But again, I haven't had that. And you. Yeah, I mean, it's just, that's the issue I've got, is the fact that I've not had people to request it. And again, it is a danger unless we restrict it to a Tuesday or a day that's going to be Which, a slow day in there. That's the day you can go in and, and look at the too good to throw away that files be, and establish one. But not on a Saturday, not on a Sunday, not on a Friday and, and Monday, those type of days, because it is extremely dangerous at that site. It's, it's narrow. All right. You can only get four let's, cars in there. Let's, that's it. let's kind of figure out, because if I'm, you know, I've, I've got a couple of choices before I would even get to Ladysmith. But if I was going to Ladysmith with a bicycle, that whether it was too good to throw away or, or recyclable, I'm still going to take the same amount of time to drop it off. Doesn't matter whether there's a box to throw it in. I'm worried about the guy that's going through to figure out what he wants. Now, now that's, that's the part that we would have to figure something out. Um, try one day, we could try one day a week to see if there's a, there's a need. Mr. Black has said he's not going to drive his bicycle from the western side of the county to Bowling Green. So he's going to just throw it in a dumpster or leave it on the side of the road one way or the other. Neither one is good. So you want to try one day a week and see if it works, see if there's any demand, and then you get a chance because you share that with, what, with I guess Madison. The, I guess the question is at the Bowling Green site, I have two questions. At the Bowling Green site, is it one day a week? No. It's, it's seven days a week, is it not? Yeah, because you've got so you have to plenty of space. Me, you have, well, six days were closed on Wednesday. And number two, Mr. Schiebel, how many accidents, can I see an accident report? How many accidents have we had at the Lady Smith Convenience Site? Do we have a list of, I mean, it sounds like all of a sudden we got, you know, catastrophic car accidents at the Lady Smith, and I haven't heard that. So I guess the question is, you know, I mean, we got people getting hurt, and I guess the question is, how many accidents have we had at that site? We haven't had a too good to throw away pile site there either. So no, I mean, it, we, we can't tell you. First, it's right. not my job to track vehicle accidents, so I couldn't tell you how many were, were there. It's something that we can try to start. Um, we have experienced and had the state That'd police there day. telling people one that they day. couldn't we, dump their trash and to continue moving because they had backed up traffic onto Route 1. That has happened several times um, in the last three or four years um, where we've had the state trooper show up on scene and tell citizens, you're blocking traffic, you have to move, go back around, come all the way down to Route 1, come back around, and if it's room, you can stay then. But, um, so we've had that. Um, you know, as far as vehicle accidents, I'm not aware myself. It is a dangerous place. It does back traffic up. Um, we have recently, uh, the board has requested for the speed limit to be lowered in that area. Um, the 20 years that I've been here, um, we have not had a too good to throw away. So we are not taking anything away from the citizens. We'll, we'll, we'll be giving them something. We, we kind of did have too good yeah. to throw away. Because um, I was here when green boxes were here. That was before my time. Since I've been here my first day on the job, I was actually okay. installing a water line to our darn right. convenience site. Well, well we, we've always had... Prior to the, the convenience sites. That's when we went to we've, man's sites. We we've always had, had the ability to acquire things that existed at the landfill, one way or the other. You know, people would go through the green box sites, people would go through whatever stuff was there. So and we have that today. The sheriff's actually working on some of those right now. And, and we understand that. And we're trying to make it safe. So we're going to move on. We're going we're to try this. Bowling Green is the one place where it's safe and we don't have to worry. So that's the one we're going to advertise. We're going to give Mr. Black um, the ability to try one day a week to see if it works over there. I'm sure Mr. Akers is going to be watching on the curve to make sure there's no accidents. But if traffic turns out to be an issue, then we'll have to do something else. 
but you'll at least have the opportunity to try that. So we'll, we'll move on with that. I'll let you and Mr. Sheba work that one day a week thing out. Can I ask? Can I ask one more question? Sure. You got you got a whole whole bunch more to ask. Uh, I guess my I guess my question is when we appropriated the, when when was the money appropriated for the the shelter because we we appropriated money for a shelter for a too good to throw away pile did we not? That's correct. When, when was that money appropriated? Uh, when the board adopted the budget in June of last year, last fiscal year. And so and that and that was a I, I assume that that was a a vote that all six of us. This, this past year, this June of this, we this past had been. You weren't the first one to talk about Too Good to Throw Away. I'd actually brought it back because I had a constituent ask me on several occasions about that. And I think that's kind of where we Nine started. Nine months ago when the board adopted right. the new solid waste convenience site standard, it was in there to do the Too Good to Throw Away. We never created the site because we didn't have the funds to be able to put the shelters out. If we were going to start taking stuff, we had to have things in place. So we put it in the budget request for it to start. So we really had planned on starting that program um, after July once we had gotten these so we knew we went ahead and ordered them uh, planning to get that going we came to the last meeting and the board voted to do away with that so we would never started it however the board had approved nine months ago to move forward with it at each of the sites so the board approved nine months ago for two sites for shelters for two sites correct shelters at all, the for all of them all shelters sites. for all of them there's one at Corbin now in the very corner I go by that one quite a bit and I haven't seen the one at the animal shelter or the one in Bowling Green, but I've just ridden by that one in a while. So I know they're there. So we're going to do one a day. I mean, one, one, one day a week. I'll let you work with Mr. Shebel to see what that one day is best for the folks in, in, in the western part of the county. And we'll go from there. Now, you had another question, another set of questions. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I, I just, I'll be honest with you. I mean, the one day a week thing, I just don't think that's fair to the citizens of the western side of the county. I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. I, I think it should be the same for, for all residents, and no matter where you're in Bowling Green or whatever. But if that's the board's, you know, if that's a consensus of the board, one day is better than one day is better than, than nothing. One day is better than none. And if the one day turns out to be something that works out, we can look at expanding it. This is just a pilot program. You one could, day is a concern though for the staff. Seven days. I mean, six six days ago to to Bowling Green. Right. Right. So we're not cutting anybody out of. The opportunity no. to go. And, and on, on, his sh on your one shelter that will be in the Ladysmith area, it will say, we accept too good to throw away on Thursday, Friday, whatever the one day is. If you have others, you can take it to Bowling Green the other six days. And we'll leave it at that. Okay? One day a week is, I'd rather do it every day and instead of one. And the reason why is because now you're going to be collecting this stuff. And then you're going to have a line of people fighting over, I was here first, why well, I was here first, who, you know, if you have it open, and I can just see that being an issue, I really can. Because if you've got a bunch of lawnmowers, the first guy in line is going to get what he wants. And what's the guy behind him? So I can just, unfortunately, from a logistic standpoint, I can see that being a nightmare for staff. If it was six days a week when we're open, they come in, they dump it off, the next guy comes in, he sees it, he takes it, it would be a lot more easier on staff. However... The Ladysmith site does 50% of our trash at that one site out of seven sites. We've right. asked for money to expand that site because it is so busy. Um, we've got another third of an acre. We're going to add another compactor, add some more space to be able to put more open top boxes. That, if we were going to do it, would be the ideal time to try to be able to put something at Ladysmith just because of its size. I mean, it is limited space for the amount of citizens that travel through that site. But, but we didn't fund that expansion this year. No, sir. So I had bigger priorities. Um, all right, the one-day staff nightmare versus not at all, Mr. Black. Oh, hold on. <laughs> uh, I, I, I still am sticking to my, I don't understand, I mean, Mr. Schiebel had just said all, all or nothing, correct? So I guess my question on that is, if, if, if one day is going to be an absolute nightmare for you and for the residents, to me the choice is not one day or nothing, the choice is all or nothing. That's the reality behind it. Either or. Either or. So I'm going to go out there, I'm going to put a motion on the table to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that the too good to throw away pile stays at Ladysmith convenience site. Would you, um, would you offer like, or, or accept a friendly amendment that says for a period of 30 days to see if it works? And then if it doesn't work, we're not stuck? Or 
if all of a sudden people start running into back or they're, they're fist fighting over there for the last lawnmower in the world, I can't can, imagine can, that. But can, can we do 60? Uh, that's your motion. Okay. I will accept the friendly amendment for the 60, 60 days. Second. As much as I disagree. <laughs> Well, is there, I was, I was, I was gonna say, is there any, I think we've had enough, enough discussion. All right. The motion before us is that for a 60 day time, time frame, we'll evaluate the two good to throw away at the Ladysmith Convenience Center site. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Motion carries. Uh, it was two to nothing. Okay. They voted. This is America. They voted. Nobody else voted. All right. Consent agenda is over. Um, I think we're all we're all saying we're going to try it for yeah, 60 days. That's, it's a unanimous vote. We're all saying we're going to try it for 60 days. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Emerson, can we hold you out for five minutes? Well, can we hold you out for 15 minutes? We're going to do the bond. We have some serious information that Mr. Emerson wants to uh, give us about the bond that we discussed with the school board. Um, there are some additional fees that may be incurred. We don't know whether we want to include those fees. We did get approval from the judge for $25 million, so we've got to act fast if we need to make it more. We're going to do that and then continue with public comment after we take about a 15-minute break. So we will uh, be, be uh, recessed for 15 minutes. We'll be back at 849. <laughs> I've asked Mr. Uh, Emerson, if we could do public comments before we discuss the bond, and, and that's what we're going to do. So at this time, yeah, he could, he could be agenda item 11 by the time we're done. So at this time, we will uh, open the board meeting up to public comments. At this point in time, any citizen that would like to address the board may do so. You'll have three minutes to address the board. You can speak on anything that is not a public hearing for tonight. And the only public hearing we have for tonight is a uh, text amendment for front yard. So when you come to the board, um, please state your name, your voting district, or where you're from if you're not from the county. And we will give you three minutes. Ma'am? Good, e good evening. My name is Odessa Cuffey. Most of you older supervisors know who I am. I'm here about Rousey Boulevard. That's south on number two. I'll say number two. Y'all may say 301. I'm a mile and off the road. We've been trying to get that road in the system. I've had my house since 81. My grandmother started with it in 60, 1961. The road had not gotten any further than what it was. As I told Mr. Fincher, if they came in off number two, not off 654, which it runs, exists, ex the ex extent of the road runs from 301 to Moore's Mill Road. And I'm a mile in. And the main thing I'm here trying to tell is I told him, I've been sick myself the past, last year this time I was in a nursing home. Is there any way that you all can get that road fixed because we know when it's coming? If an ambulance or the fire department had to get back in there, it'd be very difficult. Okay. And uh, I just thought I would come and appeal again to see if anything that you all can do anything about it. Thank you, Ms. Cuffey. What we're going to do is we will do all of the public comments, and then we'll come back and address whichever ones we can. Okay? All right. Thank you. So while, while you're here now, you're related to Estelle Cherry? Yes. Okay. Same family. Okay. I, I remember her from being yes. here because that's my mother's name. Okay. So, all right. We will address that as soon as we're done. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the board on any matter? My name is Jack Creasy. Uh, I live in Landor on the uh, Heritage Side. I'm here again. Uh, my uh, little three-minute speech is going to change just a little bit since uh, what happened before, so uh, I'll have a couple of comments about that. Hold on a second. <laughs> let's, let's let Mr. Underwood take his call, and then we'll be right back with you. Uh, we haven't started your time, Mr. Creasy. Oh, Don't okay, worry. Thank you. Uh, Right this, is, this is my original <laughs> speech. 
Uh, I want to thank uh, the supervisors and the administrators for considering my appeal concerning the rules of the Lady Smith Disposal and Recycling Center. My special thanks go to those who supported my appeal. I was, of course, saddened to see that a majority of the supervisors at that time voted against it. Uh, my appeal, of course, is to find a way to compromise to allow private uh, uh, Caroline citizens to take advantage of the many items left at the center which are reusable, either as is or repairable, or useful as spare parts and pieces for machinery and other items they already own. That compromise, of course, would have to preclude wholesale scavenging of scrap metal for sale by individuals or entities for profit, because the county already does this to raise revenue and reduce taxes. As a property owner and tax uh, a payer, I fully support this effort. However, it must be remembered that pr the primary purpose of elected officials is not simply to cut taxes, but first and foremost to provide for services that bring greater good, the greatest good, to their constituents. It occurs to me that the main arguments voiced against revising the rules at the center are twofold, and both can be resolved reasonably. They are, one, to limit loss of county revenue by preventing scavenging of scrap for sale by individuals or entities for profit. This activity is rightfully reserved for the county. Two, to avoid unreasonably increased responsibility on the part of the, of the center's working staff. The first concern seems to, uh, seems to assume that my Caroline County neighbors are basically dishonest and will take advantage of any relaxation of the rules. I disagree. I think most citizens obey the law once it is made clear to them simply because it is the law. I think the second concern of increased responsibility for the staff is minimal. I've talked with almost all of them at one time or another. They're always friendly and eager to help. Every time Henry sees me, he asks me how he can help. I'm convinced he's capable of responsibly overseeing any abuse of reasonable rules. Three, the thing that does, which doesn't seem to come up in the discussion is the one that concerns me most, which I will call the moral imperative. I personally believe it is a sin and a moral crime to destroy good things that others could use without letting them even see and examine them. The thought of melting down a child's bicycle or scooter that might cost a family $50 to $100 into a lump of shapeless metal worth $1.50 to the county, uh, which is made up, by the way, of citizens who've already paid for these things uh, with their taxes, it makes my skin crawl. Perhaps in my, it's my outdated cultural upbringing. I was born in 1936, the depth of the Depression, when the mantra was, use it up, wear it out, make it do, do without. Maybe the mantra has changed to throw it out, buy a new one from the Chinese. I had a list of things that I wanted to tell you I saw and photographed uh, from being taken from the dump that I thought were really useful, uh, Greasy, but I think my time You're going to have up. to summarize, yes, okay. okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak re uh, on public comments? I'm the other half of that team, Donna Creasy from Lake Landor. We live in a disposable society. Everything just about is disposable, and as a marriage and family counselor, I'll tell you that now includes relationships and even children. It's a mindset. And it's not good for us, it's not good for our families or lifestyle, and it's not good for our planet. I grew up in a family with parents who came of age during the Great Depression. So we used things up, repurposed things until they had absolutely no future. I have a hard time throwing something away that has a potential use or to me or to someone else. I became a trash picker when I lived in New York City, as in my 20s when I lived on a shoestring budget because my rent ate up over half of my paycheck. I was amazed at what people threw out because they don't have yard sales in Manhattan and no one wants strangers coming into their house. I actually got some really nice items to use. When we moved to Caroline seven years ago, we were pleased to see the recycling program for cans, plastic, and papers. My husband enjoyed his weekly trips to the dump because of the small treasures he found there. Wheels for an aging lawnmower from one that had been dumped. Exercise equipment. A perfectly usable wagon for hauling stuff around the yard. A children's bicycle and a scooter that our grandsons have enjoyed. We've used old oven racks to hold pots over our campfire. 
I'm very unhappy about the inability of citizens to reuse discarded items that has been shut down. And I'm happy to see that that has been changed tonight, at least on a temporary basis. Why not allow people to take whatever they can use? Put up a sign that says no professional scavenging. The, the, I, I vote for allowing people to use what they can. Why not? It not only makes people happy, but it saves them money, not an insignificant